Good afternoon and welcome. I would like to begin today's event with the museum's recently adopted Indigenous Peoples and Land Acknowledgement, which was written in collaboration with the CMA Native American Advisory Committee. The Cleveland Museum of Art acknowledges the many indigenous people who have been dispossessed from this region. For millennia, they occupied, lived from, and cared for the waterways in Ohio and the land in Ohio. Even the state's name derives from a Seneca term meaning beautiful river. Today, Native Americans sustaining their heritages, beliefs, and practices are making contributions to the region's life and vitality. With this statement, we affirm our commitment to creating respect, respectful and enduring collaborative relationships with them. I would like to welcome you to our Fran and Warren Rupp Contemporary Lecture Series, for which we owe gratitude to Fran and Warren Rupp and the entire Rupp family for supporting. My name is Nadia rivera Fila, and I am the Associate Curator of Contemporary Art here at the CMA, and I am pleased to introduce our guest today, with whom I'll be in conversation, the artist Fierlai Baez. A New York-based artist, Fierlai was born in the Dominican Republic with deep roots in the Caribbean that feed into the historical and imaginative content of her artwork. She often works in exuberantly colorful paintings on canvas, works on paper, as well as large-scale sculptures and installations. She received an MFA from Hunter College, a BFA from the Cooper Union School of Art, and her many honors and recognitions are too numerous to mention here, but I will touch on some of them in the course of our conversation. Those of us here in Cleveland may recall her stunning installation in the East Wing Glass Box as part of Front International Triennial this past summer, and she was also included in the most recent Venice Biennale, and she has four forthcoming solo exhibitions at the ICA Boston and the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark. Denmark. Her work is in major, many major museum collections internationally, including our own now, so you can go see her work up in the contemporary galleries here. Welcome, Fairlai. So I would like to jump right into our conversation. And I'd like to take it back to the beginning because I think the answer to this question is often so interesting. Um, when did you first start painting? I'll give you the long winding answer to that. <laughs> um, so my first interest in painting came out of being a child and having a sister who was very, very adept at using her crayons. <laughs> and as a three-year-old, really, being in full admiration of that and wanting to be as good as her. So that was my first attempt at making some, a beautiful image. Um, but this level of painting only came after um, being introduced into different after-school art programs to things like printmaking or drawing. So a fully iterated Western, um, depiction of the figure came after being exposed to things like drawings of Leonardo da Vinci or having a monotype workshop in an after-school class. Um, all that to say that my way of entering painting is not usually very spatial. I actually have a problem with depth. I can't see, um, you know, to do perspectival painting, usually you need to have a very good sense of of um, perspective or depth. Mm -hmm. And so I usually construct my images almost in layers. They're um, structured more like uh, end scenes, end caps, in, mm -hmm. a, in, a, in a theater trope almost. Yeah. So, yeah. That's why sometimes things like the seascape in the bottom, mm -hmm. I'll do big pores onto the canvas where the things that my eyes don't know, do naturally, I'll let the environment help me out with. Oh, okay. So um, the atmosphere, the humidity in the air, the um, things in the environment, the dryness, the humidity will contribute to how a color can plume on the canvas. So very soft, very crystal, very, all those things, the marbling happens through the environment. 
That's so interesting. So, um, and you can see this a little bit in this particular work that we're showing now, but what I admire about some of your canvases, which um, the dimensions are on the screen here, they're enormous. If you haven't seen the work in our galleries, it's quite large. There's this great balance between the, a precision of creating, you know, like feathers or details, kind of um, minutia on the, on the canvas while also a freedom of kind of letting the materials do what they will, kind of like. So I guess in asking when did you first start painting, was there a moment in which you started to kind of um, un, like kind of loosen the reins on what materials can do and like really start to experiment in bold and I don't know, unrestricted ways with paint? So it's, I guess the way I came to that freedom came out of a very constrictive space. Uh -huh. um, I went into Cooper Union uh, as a student, you know, uh, who in all the after school programs I mentioned, I was doing a lot of um, live figure drawing and trying to be very good at proportions and, and knowing, centering basically everything on the human body and trying to be as specific as I could within that human body, trying to bring all my people with me when I depicted something. And while I was at Cooper Union, there was a very strong push against figuration. Mm. Um, so all the things I wanted to say, I had to figure out how to say that without mentioning anyone. <laughs> so then my wingspan became the thing that could demarcate a certain proportion. Um, the detritus in my studio was the geolocator. All the things that could be embedded within the canvas, mm -hmm. within abstraction, were my only range of specificity. Um, so of course, after undergrad, I went into the, hyper de the, the most hyper-detailed figuration I could. And now I could have a balance between them, the freedom and the specificity I could learn, honestly, I was making a lot of like Frank Bowling-esque, very visceral abstraction yeah. um, in undergraduate school and a lot of printmaking. And so now I can have a balance of both. I can bring the people and the things that I love in the figuration and have something probably more indexical, more true to my lived uh, experience in what the materiality actually does in the painting. Mm -hmm. um, they're usually over documents, I call them map paintings, but honestly, the map is the actual making. Mm -hmm. um, the more truthful act of geolocation is the painting itself, like how the tilt of the floor made the paint flow in a certain way, how um, the dryness of the air made a color break or, or loosen, um, like, yeah, that could only happen in my floor in my studio in the Bronx. Right. Or there were these other paintings where only the dryness and the insects in Rome created a certain way of the, the color pooling. That's so interesting to hear you say that there was this kind of, this moment in your schooling where um, abstraction was really celebrated and you were pushed towards it and then you had to kind of grow. That takes us into an, another question I'd like to ask about identity. So um, identity shapes your outlook as an artist a great deal. And even paintings like the last one, parts of it that may seem abstract and some others, um, they really do tell a lot about your experiences skin color, hair texture. Um, can you talk a little bit about how identity relates to your artworks? Yeah, so I guess my um, main drive in the work is to even just show how everything reveals identity. Mm -hmm. When you have a Morandi still life that is showing everything around it, there is a world war going on at the same time, why would you choose to have this very quiet, still space? Yeah. Um, so whenever I make a figure that is hyper-specific 
It's also to be a foil. So for instance, when I make a selection of images over book pages that have a broad range from like a land survey in Ohio mm -hmm. or um, the great statesman in the US and pair that with figuration that is coming from the Caribbean, so much of the work is not the delicate miniature over the painting. All that is to bring the viewer closer and trap their breath, have their interaction with that paper, that becoming the work itself. For me, the transformation of this substrate that held a specific history that binds us all, the viewer and myself, mm -hmm. into creating something new in the future, into transforming the environment that we actively whether passively or actively, mm -hmm. are in the act of transforming. Um, so in something like this, these two portraits that you see in the background, they are markers for me of very particular American history. So the Tignon laws in um, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And it's a point in history, in American history, where um, it was a territory owned by the French, who then gave it to their Spanish cousins, momentarily while they got rid of a small insurrection mm -hmm. and it happened to be the only um, nation to actively defeat Napoleon and that was Haiti. Um, so how much of the things that we take for granted or that we live every day unacknowledging are accumulations of experience. Um, so during this period, one of the first laws that the Spanish mayor put in place was to outlaw free black women's hair and essentially uh, force them to wear these head wraps called tignons that um, I guess the mayor in, his, in the writing and the documentation of it thought that these women had far too much agency. Being freed women, they could buy property, free family members and they thought to they were thought to be the hair seemed to be a key to their like it was labeled licentious mm -hmm. um so they thought if we could have this marker that puts you closer to a house slave enslaved person then you wouldn't your agency would be curtailed and of course these women were so badass that they turned this symbol of oppression into something a symbol of of status and luxury so you'll see portraits of um, European noble women with similar headdresses. Yeah. So that conversation and that reverberation is something that I've always been interested in and how you could have subversive beauty. And that is an, um, a thing that comes through. And even when you look at these portraits, um, you'll see the detail and the closer you get, the more abstracted the figure becomes. One of my favorite moments is the shoulder of the figure with the blue headdress. That area is marbled and becomes like a full terrain. It's almost like a landscape. Um, but it's kind of tricky to see. Yeah, like kind of like From that. up close. So if you ever see her in person, get close and you'll see just, yeah. And the eyes in these are so pronounced, kind of like what you're saying about this um, transgressive, um, uh, kind of backstory to the history of these figures, I think really comes out in like the gazes that they return to the, to the Thank viewer. Thank you. So I don't know, do you all have any Costa paintings in the collection here? I don't know off the top hmm. of my head. So these are, um, right around the same time that these laws were being enacted, there were these really beautiful paintings called Costa paintings, and it was essentially uh, the... I think primarily a Barrow tradition, so Portugal and Spain, but primarily Catholic Spain, would have these paintings that would have a very, uh, yeah. So There's basically like a, a hierarchy based on your skin color that was. A very detailed caste system to the 24th degree that essentially said who you were supposed to be in your culture mm -hmm. and what you, uh, what freedoms were allowed according to your place in that structure. And they are some of the seemingly most tender, intimate portraits of intermixed marriages all the way to the 1500s, but they enacted a very violent history. Mm -hmm. um, and the, everything from the width of your smile 
to the slightest tone of your skin would be codified. And that's why I never usually have anything but the eyes embedded within it, mm -hmm. with the idea that the eyes are the one space where a sense of interiority and agency is fully enacted, irrespective of all the codifications that would happen outside of that. Um, so, yeah. That, I feel like that's a, a, ne a nice segue to these, which, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of have that same um, inspiration from like maybe the Costa paintings and looking at these yeah, silhouettes. Yeah, so coming from a space in the Caribbean where all this uh, codification, although not formally acknowledged, it's embedded within popular language. So a newscaster would be described as a loba or as a, there are, are just certain words, like we now know in popular culture the word mulatto um, or quadroon, like they, these are words that were codified within that. And it would be um, now part of just regular language. And so I wanted to make that present and merge that with something like the, fan, the paperback test in the US, how these codifications and gatekeeping spaces are, even though the ideologies are different in the global north and south, mm -hmm. they essentially were created for the same space. Mm -hmm. So these were meant to be portraits, they're self-portraits for about a year, where I would just take a swatch of my forearm and color match that, and that's what you see as a rougher brush stroke and a silhouette of my hair. Um, I don't know. So they're all self-portraits? They're all self-portraits. Okay. And just the understanding that like uh, sunlight, seeing, uh, mixing color inside, indoors versus outdoors, all that is variable and fallible. I wanted to understand human eyesight as much as we think is scientific and factual is just a daily invention and intervention by each one of us. That blue and cream dress should have been like a really good clue. <laughs> I, I myself only see the cream dress. Oh, right, the, the, the internet famous dress, the yes. viral dress that Which, some people saw in different colors. Exactly, so it's your ability to see local color. I mix, obviously, like I can mix color very well, um, and I can color match, but if it has a blue underlighting, like what you see a lot in, under, in digital screens, mm -hmm. I will see only the blue light in that screen, and that's why some people only see the cream dress, okay. because they're picking hyper-local color. Yeah. It sucks, my sisters are nurses and they see exactly <laughs> the tone of blue. They're like, this is that, and that's what in actuality it is. Right, um, so interesting. It's like such an objective way yeah. of reading color. And that, that on its own, we think it's objective, but then environment changes our perception yeah. always. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the title here, Can I Pass? Like, yeah, so, I mean, the, it's, it's a very literal. This is something I did right, you know, baby studio practice. Right, it's an early work, 2011. <laughs> yeah, so this ago. work, I was just thinking, in these two vetting spaces, where would I be perceived? What would I be perceived as? Um, and all the fraud interaction that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. So the fan test was this imagined test, but also something that um, there's hearsay of um, in the Dominican Republic after the end of enslavement, you could, within the law, divorce someone uh, by retroactively saying, I was bamboozled into thinking they were this thing and they were not, in fact, this other thing. In terms of race. In terms of race. And so they would perform a fan test. And if your hair didn't have a certain lassitude, uh, oh. then you would be, those would be grounds for divorce, which is just That's insane. ridiculous and hilarious. Um, so then Dominican women, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, there's like a culture of like having a lot of techniques for straightening hair. There's a Dominican blowout. And then, you know, there is just things that we think are as cultural phenomena have deep structural roots in other things. Um, yeah. And it's just, 
interesting to think of and to note, to be conscious of how our choices are predicated by many, many things. Right. So we can make maybe more informed choices or kinder choices or, yeah. Yeah, the, the um, theme of hair texture comes into your paintings often. I think we'll also get to some later paintings here that we can talk about too where we can point it out. But uh, yeah, this is interesting as an early work of yours that starts to get at these um, greater issues. So I wanted to talk to you about so st stories, stories and narratives that are part of your culture, a big part of your artwork. And so I want to talk about how some of your artworks animate these um, cultural stories in such compelling ways. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the Siguapas first. Do you want to give us like a background on the, the Siguapa? Sure. So I'm sure we've all been familiar with rambunctious kids or um, when you're a child, what are the stories that we tell children to get them to either behave or become interested or... Um, to not to, run off. To not run <laughs> off, to basically like focus that energy. And one of the stories I was told as a child, and I would be a rambunctious little kid who would be climbing trees and falling off trees and rolling down hills. And my interest was always to be in nature and outdoors. And... Um, what they would tell us as little girls in the Caribbean would be stories of a ciguapa. And she was always framed as a trickster, um, as a figure from the landscape, and the opposite of civilized. Uh, so not as a, as a good story of like, being in nature is good, being having a certain level of Freedom and um, fugitivity is good. It was always like, if you don't behave, you will be wild like a ciguapa. If you don't conform, this is this is the 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 outside the outside of a civilized. I'm trying to not use certain words that are going to just be like, this is the liminal <laughs> space that you're going to just like be in limbo forever. Um, so she as a trickster, as a kid who loved nature and who wanted to be um, outside the spotlight, seemed like the ultimate freedom. Her feet were backward, so if you ever followed her footsteps, you were going in the wrong direction. She could um, break a family's kar karmic load in one go. There's this beautiful novel by Gino Diaz called uh, The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, and it's this, um, intergenerational story of a family migrating from the Dominican Republic to the US. And um, there's this one midpoint. And she's only referenced in the, in the footnotes, the Siguapa, oh. where, yes, where um, this one figure is about on the brink of death on a sugarcane field after being um, beat up by the dictator's goons. Mm -hmm. And this figure comes out of the nature and picks her up and says, you have the energy, you can go, you'll survive. And she finds her way out and finds her way out of the country. And, and that was a ciguapa? That was a ciguapa. Okay. But if you see, the, the, it's almost like a mirage of a description, mm -hmm. this thing that could potentially be a mongoose mm -hmm. or a wildebeest, or like there's all these descriptions, there's never anything fixed. Right, and but I also remember you saying that she like she's kind of like a wildling who like yes. lives in the woods. Yes, and she would like lure people. So she's kind of a little. So bit that's of a the siren. thing. The normative story is that she is this um, Lilith-like figure who's very beautiful, has a long mane of hair, and who will um, lure men into the forest. Um, so that's one one way of describing her. So it's always like this kind of Mary Magdalene wanton thing. Um, so then, as an adult, I could, I almost saw her as a way of people's projection of nature, as a, a really good Rorschach vessel for exploring what, what people were bringing in, what, what personal baggage each viewer would bring in with them, mm -hmm. um, and unpacking it, and maybe having a space for conversation. Um, there's this beautiful sculpture of a German Mary Magdalene that was actually one of my first 
inspirations for how to do this. And German wooden sculptures are trippy as heck. They're beautiful. <laughs> but she essentially, there's a story of Mary Magdalene going into the wilderness like John the Baptist. And you know how he comes back with his like matted furs and long hair. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Mary Magdalene comes in just covered in hair. And you have the normative stories later in, in, diff in older, in later stories where it's like it's a long mane of hair and she's more like, you know, sexy Magdalene. Yeah. But in these North German depictions, she's just like matted fur everywhere. And it's the most delicately carved curly cues. <laughs> and so this idea of um, visions of desirability and viscera and um, like what is beautiful and repugnant at once uh, was a point of interest just visually. And then looking at like uh, drawings of Carl Linnaeus mm -hmm. and how those two merged as ways of seeing other beings in the new world mm -hmm. and how you could see a turn in either the mechanization or the remove that psychologically was created to treat the other. Interesting. So I had always, and we're looking now at a painting that um, you kind of use the Siguapa and mobilize it in your artwork as like this kind of choosing to see it as this empowered wild woman who is like taking on notions of um, the tropical and you kind of purposefully overplay those elements. We have tropical plants coming out of her. Um, the fur is like obscures anything but her legs. She has on these like sexy heels. Um, but it's interesting to also understand that there's a layer of like the post-colonial lens. It's a counter too. It's, it's acknowledging yeah. that gaze and looking back and saying, this is also desirable. This is also beautiful. I have aunts who have been trained to only wear heels and they have shortened their Achilles tendon so much that it hurts to wear flat shoes. So this idea of nature and nurture, what is the balance? What are the things that we transform and that transform us in, in turn? Yeah. Um, there's incidentally a Siguapa in that very first image, uh, the Atlantic, the uh, British Empire in the Americas. Let's go back. And there she becomes a kind of cornucopia um, where you have to really, really slow down and look to find the figure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Right, you can, I can, this is the first time I've noticed it, but she's sort of stepping out of the waves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and if you're, if you're following her footsteps, you think that she's going into the ocean, but she's emerging from it, yes. I love that. Yeah, so staying on the subject of stories, um, and this is a painting that some might recognize. It was in a show here at the Cleveland Museum of Art called Picturing Motherhood Now um, a couple of years ago. And um, we borrowed this canvas, which was also large. It's called Drexia. And bef as you were sitting down here before we came on stage, there was a composition that was playing that um, Fidelay composed that is also related to this myth of Drexia, which is kind of nice to like have that connection. So do you want to talk about the Drexia myth and um, this abstract work, which is fed into a large body, a, a large body of work on the Drexia myth? Yeah, so I guess I would like to f I make space around that by saying that so much of survival in a lot of fraught spaces require a way of thinking that is so expansive that it allows you to shake out of it, mm -hmm. make our framework so much more complex that we can imagine ways that are beyond data, beyond fact. Um, so one of the things that I really loved, besides the storytelling and the Siguapa myth, the folklore, how you have to almost look at the understory of it to find the freedom within it, but it is embedded. It's a psychic guard built in within that folklore. Um, in the 90s, there were two American DJs from Detroit who reimagined 
the transatlantic crossing and how um, at that moment in Detroit, it was, you know, imagine living in a very blighted, in the middle of the crack epidemic, they imagined a thriving Atlantis starting from the point of the enslaved women who were pregnant, who were thrown overboard, what if they survived? What if their kids survived? And created this like technologically advanced, thriving culture. Underwater. Underwater. Uh, water breathing, what their joy, what their struggles, what their um, building would have been like, what their, their social building um, restructuring would have been like. And so, it seems like whimsical. Why at this moment of collapse would you reach for something playful and beautiful like that? But it's because of that space that you need to reimagine joy and technological advancement and thriving to be able to access it. Uh -huh. um, and so I, along with a lot of other creatives, there's writers, other musicians. So this was actually a story that was elaborated over a series of nine albums. And in the album notes, they described the Drexia civilization. Um, and so there are, I am one of many artists who have responded to it. And so this is supposed to be one aquatic moment where there are many, many figures embedded with it, within it. But you can primarily see the one on the upper right side. If you look, there's like a silhouetted head looking towards the side. Do you see her? You can see right there. there. There's the face. <laughs> yeah. Which I did not notice until I saw this painting in person. It's, it feels much more obvious so the figures like that life. reveal themselves the longer you look. I wanted something that um, gave space for rest and for um, discovery so you could really feel immersed. Mm -hmm. um, right, and to me this like adds into the imaginative qualities of your practice where you're kind of going down you know, taking these like mental deep dives into these myths and um, stories and narratives and using it as um, inspiration for thinking through these compositions that are um, complex in their own right as abstractions with hints of figuration or moments of figuration, but then also have, are made are deepened by the um, the stories that go along with it, and you know it's so nice to hear you talk about it too because it it brings such complexity to the fact that you've thought through this myth and um, and think about these civilizations, like thinking what it, what is it like in you know Detroit at this moment of crisis that allows you as musicians. These, these Afrofuturist musicians to kind of go in and create a series of nine albums that just espouses on this kind of story that they come up with and then, you know. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, genius and exemplar, but this is a long tradition within the black diaspora for accessing moments of ascension and moments of, um, healing and clarity, mm -hmm. um, we have spirituals. And it's something that in this space in the US, we think it's solely locked within the Amer North American tradition, but you find it throughout the Caribbean and Latin America, and it's just a longer, more complex thread than we um, are taught to assume. So I wanted to bring all of them in, that they were not uh, in isolation and they were in a, in a very particular lineage. So I w this is um, also a good way to segue into uh, the composition or the installation that you made here as part of Front. And um, this was in the East Wing Glass Box here in the Cleveland Museum of Art and it was on view from I think July through January, uh, and 
it had it modeled on this palace from Haiti, the Sans Souci Palace from Haiti, kind of imagining it traveling underwater through time and space and emerging from the gallery floors into our museum. Um, and I wonder if you could talk in particular about that underwater aspect of it and uh, what may be a little hard to see here were these coral compositions that were beautifully, brightly painted and had these elements in them um, of kind of under, like modern day underwater detritus, like combs and shoes and purses. Uh, and I went through the installation so many times with people who, you know, picked them out and were like, are these from her closet? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. I wanted, so the title is the geo-coordinates of this site and of Sans Souci, so having a spatial collapse between them. Um, the idea was that this emerged, you know, traveled and emerged out of what this itself used to be an ocean bed, right? So collapsing both geography and time and trying to um, bring it as close to the present as I could. And these objects that we there's so many techniques through media and painting that make us remove from things, from histories, from moments. Uh, for instance, like the making of certain civil rights images in black and white to make them historic when they were actually originally taken in color. I wanted to uh, bring to present how some of these geographies and sites were closer to who we are now mm -hmm. and have been so formative to our daily lives and choices in ways that we're taught to be removed um, from. So that was the effort for bringing in like the sneaker and the comb and the, the items that would have been in anyone's closet, um, anyone's lived experience, and turn them into this bright coral. Um, so some of the imagery even printed on the wall is from political slogans in the 60s in mm -hmm. the Biafran Revolution, or, um, and, and really remarking on how not just movements of people and bodies like, and, and goods, it's also a movement of ideas that has been going back and forth between the continents. Um, and it's present in this space because original, the Sans Souci um, in Northern Haiti was made 50 years apart from the Sans Souci in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Similar aspirations, similar architecture. Um, and they reverberated in a way that that Sans Souci in Berlin was meant to be kind of like a respite away from the strict hierarchy of the court. Here, it was meant to be a respite and a place of learning. There were printing presses, and um, so much of what's passed down in popular culture about this space is, about, is um, fragmented through a very North American lens. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I wanted to, to recenter some of the original terms for that space being made in the name itself, Carefree, Sans Souci. Um, being the first clue of that. Mm. I also wanted to ask, um, so you mentioned at the beginning like your roots as a painter and thinking primarily about things two-dimensional, but I know that you worked on this design kind of digitally at first before it came into architectural fruition. Can you talk a little bit about like what that experience was like, kind of designing it and the angles and trying to understand what it would be like for people to move through this as a three-dimensional space and it yeah. being immersive. So the, the Caribbean um, tectonic plate and the North American one are, are meeting points, and that's why there's so many earthquakes in the Caribbean, especially like in Northern Haiti. Um, so the capitals of both the Dominican Republic and Haiti used to be in the north where this is located, and then a massive earthquake hit around 1700s late 1700s, early 1800s, and that space is still um, evidence of that earthquake. Capital moved down 
to the self in both spaces. Um, and so I wanted to, the viewer, even though this is an exaggerated version of what you actually feel, mm -hmm. I wanted the viewer to be um, reminded of their physical presence by this extreme angle in the architecture. And everything starts as a drawing in a sketchbook. And then it's a negotiation with a renderer and then with an architect. Because as unstable as it looks, it still has to be sound. A wheelchair should be able to go through every archway. It should be accessible to everyone in a way that is safe. Um, so the balance of finding the experience of instability, the experience of, of um, recalibrating the viewer's sight while still keeping them safe is something that I had to um, balance in both. Interesting. Mm. So this past summer, in addition to doing the installation here, was also as a huge summer for you because you also did um, a work, these two paintings at the 59th Venice Biennale, which is the oldest international kind of contemporary art exhibition, a huge honor. Um, so I wanted to talk about these paintings and ask you what it was like developing this work for that particular show. And um, one question I, ha I haven't asked you is, was the theme of the Venice Biennale, which was kind of about surrealism this year, was that well developed and kind of were you approached with it as a prompt? No. No, I think the theme came out of choosing certain artists who had a, that thread, and I think that's where it came, where it was crystallized. Um, just a realization that so many of us were already dealing with that um, as a driving force in our making. Um, and the fact that so many Caribbean artists were influential in the Surrealist movement, but even before it was a label, there are, there's so much imagery, like when you look at Bosch, Mm -hmm. that it, if, if it had been 400 years later, it would absolutely have been labeled surreal. It exists within that space. Um, so it's more acknowledging to how other periods that were not within that label, within that pocket of ideology, were very influential to our thinking of the body, of gender, of landscape, um, and the freedom that slip, slippage creates. Um, so when I was making this piece, I was thinking of this one pivotal moment in the Drexia myth where um, Drexians are a civilization that has developed this ability to live fully within the body throughout the year and there's one space and one history keeper that keeps the collective memory in their, in their body throughout. So like a, a weighty thing to hold if you're the historian, um, both the joy and the pain, all of that is held with them as a capsule. And this one moment, everyone comes together and they create this kind of uh, womb-like space where everyone comes in and they share that history. And it's so volatile and they have so much power that if it's not contained within this space, they would um, cause storms in the, general, in the sea at large, or they would, their, their joy and pain would be so strong that it would, could be catastrophic to the environment. Interesting. So this was meant to be the space of gathering and communing, and there's a lot of figures. The more you look, it's kind of hard because here you can't see a lot of the silhouettes within it, um, but the more you navigate, I wanted it to be almost be atemporal, so you can come in and out at any point and come to that point, that converge, converging point in the middle. Um, so there's an installation. In the, yeah, in the Biennale, you would have walked right through, and behind each painting were the series of speakers. So you were meant to feel the composition before you heard the sound or saw what you saw in front of you. If you uh, felt it in the beginning, it's a very bass heavy, so it was meant to feel like you were in the depths of the ocean and there are these core moments that 
are like air bubbles rising through. So. Nice. And then once they were, and in real, they have like a luminosity to them because you use these paints that have like glitter. No, so right it's or? fully alchemical. It being a, the ocean, a uh, technique that a lot of painters and dyers use is to just add salt. Oh. And salt crystallizes water-based paint in a certain way. It, it saturates the color, but then crystallizes and looks like glitter. So it incentivizes you getting closer and moving around. No sight line will ever be the same. Um, so it's like we're getting a third of the experience. I know. Images truly don't do it justice, but th that's interesting because it has a texture and then the way that it was lit, you could see these little moments of like luminosity. Like it looked like glitter. It looked like glitter, but yeah. But now I know that it was salt. <laughs> well, it's like uh, sometimes some people will use mica, but this um, just responds to the environment and crystallizes in that way. And so it truly is like salt, like the salt of the sea. And the more, let's say, a viewer comes in and gets really close and leaves a bit of their breath, the more crystals will form. Oh, from like the humidity. Mm -hmm. Well, the that humidity must and have the been dry. happening. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, with the canal. These <laughs> it were, was so humid. Yes. I mean, yeah. yeah. The, the waterways were right outside the building on both sides, so, yeah. yeah. Good and bad. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the work that we have, are very lucky to have in our collection now, um, and is up now, recently installed in our galleries. And shortly after we chose the artwork and acquired it, um, you sent me some, some like these images, like the one on the right here of your sketchbook and like and it made me think like how does she even start to conceptualize these paintings um, before they become the monumental can works on on canvas so this is maybe a fourth stage there's usually a very large pour and which i think we see in the next image of it um, and this originally was overlaid onto a chart from the 19th century of a hierarchy of beings of all life forms, quote unquote, in, a, in the globe. And I thought there was such a hubris to think, and so human to think we could categorize the relation between beings and to try to create a very literal hierarchy between them. When in reality we are in relation with everything around us. Um, to be trite or not, we're made of the same material and are of stars <laughs> and reverberate with each other. So I wanted to um, have a response that felt truer to who we are and how we, um, the joy and the reveling of that. Um, and there's something that you can never get in a document when you see it in person and you move around it, you should feel that shimmer and should feel how um, there are marks that suggest everything from aquatic life to, you know, birds in the air and beings on land. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll go to the next image just, just to see so that people can understand. Um, and this kind of beginning of laying down the paint layers, you can see underneath there's a map that you began with that was, I think it's just called Plate 36, Vertical and Latitudinal Distribution of Animal Life. And you have like these little, it's like very gridded, and there's these charts. Um, and then over that, you know, your um, counterweight to something that is so scientific and rigorous is to completely think of all animal life on the planet as being this kind of like explosion of roiling. Ooh. Yes. Yes. Um, so I, yeah, I, it's when you think of one of these semi-abstract compositions, 
like you kind of start up with your sketchbook and what I can gain from this picture of your sketchbook is that you're thinking of it more in terms of how um, much energy to put to certain aspects of the composition when you think of it overall. Yeah, so I wanted to calibrate the energy around it. Um, so this was more for me to realize what kind of movements in space I wanted to get the viewer to experience and feel. So if you see in this one, it's, um, it's that printmaking again, where I'm seeing slices of space constructed. As much as there is movement everywhere, I wanted a certain projection to happen. And of course, because this is very much responding to the material itself, um, these are things that work in a moment. And if something happens later that is more effective, I don't restrict myself to, a, to that one thing. Um, there are so many times where you make like a beautiful mark and you try to make a pocket around it and you're like, oh, but I have to keep you. And then you realize it's holding everything down and you have to just erase it. And one of them being like, <laughs> I had my niece in the studio for a summer and she uh, was like maybe three and a half, really bright little sprite and like, um, I loved working with her around and she was just making marks and running around and at one point, because my canvases go from horizontal to vertical, this little like 25 pound being just ran across them. <laughs> <laughs> and her like feet were maybe this long and you see her little footsteps going across a lot of them. And I'm like, how do I preserve this footstep? It's so beautiful and like so present. But then that had to just be a secret for myself because it didn't work with the composition. But yeah. Yeah, I loved knowing that there's like some tiny little footsteps running through our, the canvas in our galleries. Um, so I encourage everyone to go upstairs and, uh, and check out the painting, and we will also have a reception after with, afterwards in the private dining room. Um, but now I wanted to open it up to, to any questions. Uh, we have microphones on either side. Don't be shy. Um, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my question is for, L for Free Ally, but before I say that, I first want to say thank you, Nadia. This was amazing. Thank you for bringing this here. Thank you for bringing her here. As a young Haitian man, this meant a lot to me, so just appreciate you. Thank you, Daniel. Talk up for Nadia. <laughs> <laughs> and for now, for my question, uh, one, thank you for being here. Throughout all of this, you spoke a lot about kind of your identities, your different cultures, your different heritages and how they inform your artwork and how they kind of stack up and line with each other. And you have such heavy, your heritages are such heavy ones filled with like long traditions. So you spoke about your Haitian heritage, your Dominican heritage, and your American heritage. So I wondered, in the same way that you feel like they align with each other sometimes to lead to a point, do you ever feel like they like uh, extract from each other and compel? And if so, how would that be then depicted in your work? I think the extractive part of it is so present in our popular psyche, that a lot of my effort is to remind how much more the lines of influence might not be what we're taught or are, are expecting. So even the fact that like two thirds of the US would be speaking French right now, if it wasn't for a particular point in Caribbean history. Um, it's just a quick reminder, and those are big epic moments, but they are current and more fluid than we're taught. A lot of um, even aesthetics around the body, where as someone coming from the Caribbean, uh, being taught that we were always like in a 10 year lag between, uh, behind popular culture in the US, but technically then you look back and you realize the things that were being prized, the sounds that were being created then reverberated further into the US and became the popular music in the 2000s or became the way of seeing the female body or adapting ways of dress or like 
a lot of influences, even though we're, we're in this seesaw situation happening where popular culture will show up there in a certain way, and then our popular culture will completely go with our diasporas and influence the world. Um, yeah, so it's not historic, it's current, it's thriving, and it's constant. Um, and that once it's in the center, we'll be like, this is where that was borrowed, but I wanted to go to the origin and be like, this is the point of, point of brilliance, like really highlight it. Hi. <clears throat> I am curious about your take on masks for this entire generation. You showed only eyes in many of your representations. And having gone to medical school, we recognize people only by their eyes. But this generation of children is speaking much later than they would. Uh, teachers have a hard time recognizing children by only their eyes. Have you pursued those images? So I've actually done a whole series of masks. And my point of interest for them was actually more through ritual and um, the mask as interlocutor or a way of accessing a different psychic or energetic space. And I always wonder about that too of our mediated interactions. So outside of just regular masking, like the physical obstruction, what are the other transformative points for that generation? Um, they will develop other language. They will develop other ways of interacting. And in the same way that I always think of like even the development of the printing press or the locomotive, like you see all this text of like, oh my God, this tech is just overwhelming. There's no rest. The main obstruction I think is that we are so adaptable. We will transform, we will incorporate all the obstructions and become something else. If we would like to preserve certain things, then that means we have to be very conscious and counter obstruct or adapt to it. So the screen is a mask. The distance is a mask. It's not just the physical obstruction to the lips. Like there are ways of adapting that are generous and gorgeous with it. We could do, the, we could protect each other in ways that are um, as brilliant as the potential for human beings is. Uh, there is actually a, a really wondrous headline that came up in my, uh, in the, that was featured in the Times recently of, um, I think it's Sweden is developing new tire, new cars that charge on the road. As you drive, you get a whole, your, you, your car is replenished. And that just made me think like, my God, the things that we are, that are within us to not be bound by certain limits are just wondrous. So certain things that we see as a concrete limiter, we're constantly reminded that there are ways of being outside of it. So I wonder, yeah. I spent most of my time in the Caribbean underwater because um, I did scuba diving. And you s so much of the world has not seen the Caribbean that way. Were you underwater a lot as a child? So I, like many Caribbeans, don't know how to swim. I actually learned last January. <laughs> um, and there are many geopolitics that inform that. I actually got some, like, um, crash courses on swimming in Germany for the first time this January. And that's where I, I can now go from one end of the pool to the other. But I've never been afraid of water. I've always wanted to, um, I've always been in, compelled to depict water in all my images. Um, but there was always, always a kind of like um, a psychic barrier to doing that.
Hello, um, I'm Dominican and I can't swim either, so there you go. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I really love the way that you, the beautiful way in which you layer history and oppression and racism and laws and policies um, in such an impactful way. So thank you for the way that you do the work. Um, so my question is related to the terror that Trujillo had in impacting both DR and Haiti. So, and in my upbringing, my mother grew up during Trujillo's dictatorship. And um, I was a child when Balaguer was still, was president. The way in which there, the practices of terror impacted both perceptions of race and gender control. Can you talk a little bit about the messages of that um, and how that impacts those of us who are first generation in this country or second generation in this country? So I think I'm pretty blessed by having been raised in Miami, in the American South, in a way that kind of allowed me to see both those worlds from the periphery. And I think no one sees a center more than someone who's outside of it. Um, to just see in a more structural way what were the things driving choices. I remember as a child, part of my interest in the Siguapa story was how it gave little doorways me growing up with a primarily matriarchal family, doorways for living outside those oppressive normative histories. Like, there were these badass women living their lives, having full jobs and their children, and like, you know, being heads of their communities uh, in ways that if you read the normative story would have seemed an impossibility. Uh, so, but they were a fact, and there are there are facts of our everyday experiences that are not usually highlighted in these hierarchical stories of the global south, quote unquote, or views of the Caribbean. And my impetus is to, you know, we can always study the hyper-local histories, the Dominican Republic, animosity with Haiti, history in Haiti, the Geopolitics, if we go hyper-focused onto that site, it seems insurmountable. And then something that has been a bit of a respite and is to think how they relate to the world, how they are many times not started from within, but from pressures from without, and uh, they're cyclical. And so as someone who navigated both spaces. I would go spend the summer there and have my schooling here. Being able to speak to those and to say, hey, this is who we are now. This is who we were 100 years ago. This is what our space was 1,000 years ago. How do we um, reverberate? And how can we find ways of being that are outside of that? But how are we, at the moment, living in spaces that are counter to that? How are the people within our community? Who do we celebrate? Like, there are moments where you can be like, um, here's how all the land was taken away by Trujillo, how all this land was given by Trujillo, who was being mechanized by these hyper-local histories, who was being weaponized by these local histories, or I could be like, here is the response to that. Here are the people who resisted that. Here how, is how we survived despite that, and how we can maybe center that and create more room for it is, I don't know if that, that was too meandering, but like my view is not to go hyper-local and specific to the thing, but to study it systemically and to say, we are far more than that. We have, we are, we have proven to be far more influential in that. And not only, like the, the history of the victim is always an easy narrative when you're trying to impose a hierarchy. 
but the history of empowerment and counter influence is hardly ever highlighted and I wanted to be able to center that and to make other people aware of that like as much as you influence you're being influenced back yeah thanks we have, uh, we have time for one more question Thank you. I just want to say thank you for this beautiful work. Thank you for making it. Thank you for bringing it to Cleveland for us all to enjoy for the future. Um, my question is more of a technical question about the Kalabi Yao space paintings at the Biennale. Um, it looked as though you had two very large canvases, but then you also painted out into the space. And I was just curious, did you do the canvases in a studio somewhere and then paint the walls there? Like bring them and then color match and remix the salt? And, and if you could talk a little bit about the uh, technical process there. Oh yeah, so all of this is like a geeking out about materials as much as like the words come after, you know, I'm a filter for culture and for all these things and I allow that, I allow that when I look back, I'm like, oh, I see how that came in or, oh, that's present. But these were, adapted to the space. Um, if you went to the corridor, it's this like several hundred foot long, long corridor where you're seeing art after art after art and it becomes almost like oversaturation if you don't have anything to mediate or to like slow down your viewing process. So I came in to these kind of short walls in a 40 foot paintings. In the studio, I had to develop like a winch system because usually I'm picking, it's like giant parasailing with these canvases where I have to pick them up and put them down at the same time. So I had these winches, each one is 250 pounds. I couldn't do that in the Arsenale. My mechanisms were out. So what I do usually in a lot of installations is that I'll, I'll have a painting just for the art handlers like something that they'll see when the painting comes down. So underneath this are these kind of mask-like portraits that were surrounding these speakers that were activating the painting. So I had imagined what I would do behind the canvas, but I didn't know how colorful or reduced the things around them would be. And something that you don't see in this angle is that there were these like very saturated, uh, colorful textile works that were right in front of it. And so I'm, I had to figure out how to be in balance with that, how to create sight lines that segued easily between them um, without it getting lost. So a lot of the wall is a response to that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good job. Check out the painting, right? Yeah, check out the painting and please join us. We will have a reception with Fairlai in the private dining room um, here at the museum. So you can say hello and if you didn't get a chance to congratulate her, you can do so.